Warning, the following podcast contains obscene language, even British stuff like clunge and bugger. Now that I said clunge and bugger. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Satellites and Wires and Shit. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Hi, my name is Teresa English. I'm running for state representative in Massachusetts because someone has to fix this shit. The incumbent is proof that we did, in fact, evolve from filthy monkey men. It's September 30th, and that's still just enough September for me to be all by myself again. I'm No Illusions, and from Anna Bosnick's New Jersey, Cincinnati Red State, and Redtown Blue State, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, Kenneth Copeland will admit that he was just lying for the money the whole time, Cecil and Eli will finally consummate their relationship, and I'll just start making shit up for the introductory bullet points. But first, the diatribe. In my experience, the most underappreciated field of study in all the world is ethical philosophy. I've read whole books, bestsellers, that would have been obviated if the author had so much as taken a weekend fucking seminar in ethics. And I honestly think that one of the reasons ignorance of that subject is so ubiquitous is that we've all been playing along with this fantasy that religion teaches ethics for so long that we've forgotten what ethics even is. I, I consider this. Imagine you walk into your first class of ethics, right? Ethical philosophy 101 or whatever. And the professor starts off going like, okay, murder, bad. Stealing, bad. Giving to charity, good. Like, And yet, that's about the extent of the ethical tutelage you can expect from a church. Their version of the trolley problem has one empty track on it. It shouldn't be like that. They go to church every fucking week. Some of them go two or three times a week. And I get that morality isn't the only thing that they talk about, but it's like one of the main three or four things, isn't it? You'd think by the time these motherfuckers reached adulthood, they'd all but have the equivalent of a PhD in moral philosophy. But if anything, they've been ethically handicapped by deontological bullshit through their formative years without ever being taught what fucking deontology means. I mean, sure, at its most basic level, being a moral person is about behaving morally. Like, you know, most of our moral lapses come when we know good and damn well that we're doing something wrong. But we also understand the right thing intuitively most of the time. You know, yeah, you got to tell a three-year-old not to bite people or whatever, but as soon as we've got a solid handle on theory of mind, we also work out all the do-unto-others-level ethics stuff. This is some a priori shit, and yet it's essentially the full extent of Christian moral teachings. Of course, if you really want to learn about ethics, you don't focus on shit like, you know, thou shalt. Instead, you drill down on real moral dilemmas. Right? If there's a fire in a museum, are you justified in saving a priceless work of art instead of a person? Why or why not? How do you make that decision in real time? And by doing that, you actually prepare yourself for novel circumstances where the ethical decision might actually be tricky or might not be clear. Now, admittedly, some churches do some stuff like that some of the time, but they have to dip their toes into it very carefully because their whole system is based on deontology. Their path to morality is to listen to God, obey the Bible, and follow the example of Christ. Anytime they present you with a problem that can't be solved with that formula, they're underscoring the fact that their whole ethical system is essentially useless. I mean, even if it somehow worked, its weakness has become pretty glaring as soon as you imagine some dude in a flaming museum flipping through the Old Testament to see if there's anything relevant in there. And look, as bad as arming people with a nearly useless moral code and then sending them out into the world with the belief that they're experts in the subject is, it actually manages to get worse. Because if your morality is based on authoritarian dictates, it's way easier to manipulate than one based on, say, the consequences of your actions. I'm not saying consequentialism can't be manipulated. Plenty of 21st century genocides would be quick to point out my error if I did. But it's way harder than manipulating a moral code that basically boils down to because I said so. 
or, or because the invisible guy I speak for said so. Bit of a distinction without a difference. And sure, this causes plenty of problems on the individual level, but that's nothing compared to the problems it creates culturally. Consider the pandemic, right? Here we are facing a moral dilemma that, while not exactly novel, is something nobody alive remembers having to deal with before. And the ones who are getting the ethics wrong most consistently are precisely the group that prides itself on its ethical superiority. These are people who all but worship the idea of self-sacrifice. They're Messiah, in their minds anyway, is the very embodiment of that concept. But that doesn't matter because theirs is a rules-based morality and there's no rule in the Bible that says thou shalt wear a fucking mask and get your fucking shot. Of course, I'm sure you could go through the Bible and find plenty of passages that clearly indicate that getting vaccinated and masking up is the moral thing to do. But to do so would be to miss the point. The problem isn't the specific moral precept that we're working with, but rather the very framework that they're putting it on. A thing is made moral by a moral authority proclaiming it. In this instance, the preponderance of those moral authorities, in their minds anyway, said that the moral thing to do was to stand up for your rights, refuse the shot, and aggressively breathe on as many people as possible. Now, there were some moral authorities for all of them saying the opposite, yes. And for some of those folks, that might have been a pretty even mix. Maybe even the majority were saying to do the right thing, but that doesn't matter because at the same time that they're being told that morality is based on following a set of fucking rules, they're also being told that a ghost will whisper the right answer to them if the problem is ever too tough. So so when they encounter conflicting moral dictates, their ethical system literally tells them that the moral choice is whatever the fuck they feel like. This is at least part of the reason why reforming the faith can't work. Yes, progressive Christianity is better than regressive Christianity, but so is almost everything. The root of the problems, though, are so deeply woven into the fabric of the faith that you can't tease them out without the whole damn thing unraveling. And that's not a bad thing. The whole thing unraveling, as we've demonstrated over and over again, is the most moral outcome possible. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast and bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the ghosts of Heath and Eli. We're off for one more week, and it turns out we actually recorded way more headlines than we needed. So rather than letting them go to waste, we're going to forego the normal C segment this week and join a marathon of headlines from the past already in progress. And in 12 Angry Son of Men news. Oh, the story. We have a follow up on a story from a couple months ago. Don't want about whether a jury (laughs) is allowed to ignore the evidence if a ghost told them to. (laughs) Apparently, that was an open question in our court system. And if that sounds fucking stupid, that's because it is. Mm -hmm. But it turns out the ghost in question was super credible this time. It was Christian God. After a member of the jury told the rest of the panel that God said not guilty and the judge heard about it, that juror was thrown out and the new jury found the defendant guilty. But that got appealed all the way up to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals and they decided in a 7 to 4 ruling last week what that you have to let members of the jury ignore evidence and decide based on sincerely held ghost talking. For real, this happened. What? So the whole trial got nullified, and it's an official do-over because of that 7-4 decision. Okay, Christ. this is baffling. Think about how many adults who genuinely, in no uncertain terms, are aware that there is no God, had to pretend that there is. Judges, federal judges, yeah. they still get to use the word judge after this. Oh, yeah. what do you do? <laughs> I'm a judge. They still do. Our our justice system is so fucked that at this point, the judges are pleading insanity. (laughs) So the original trial found former Congresswoman Corinne Brown guilty on multiple counts of filing false tax returns, mail fraud and wire fraud, mostly because of the very obvious digital trail and paper trail of definitely doing all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But right before deliberation was about to start, Juror number 13 said, all right, guys, put away all your nerd evidence. Boo, nerd. A higher being told me not guilty on all charges. I trust the Holy Ghost. And that's when juror number eight told the judge, who then had to go through a ridiculous process to disqualify the crazy person. And by ridiculous, I mean any process beyond (laughs) the ghost talkers out gavel. We're done here with that guy. The judge met with both attorneys 
and let him argue it out as if there was an argument here. The defense attorney claimed that religious people, they do stupid shit like that all the time. <laughs> and the judge was like, oh, you're done? That was your <laughs> argument? Okay, let's hear from the prosecution. And the prosecution explained that it would be literally impossible for any piece of real reality evidence to be more important than a conversation between a crazy person and the God of the universe. Hey, defense guy, what if God had told him that she was guilty? What precedent could this possibly set that you right, want nuts. to have set? Well, even be even better, make it black. Or, or in this case, make it white, right? So, right. like, what if the yeah. juror said, don't worry, guys, I talked to the ghost of George Wallace, and he assured me that the defendant <laughs> is too white to be a criminal, because that's exactly <laughs> what we're talking about. Yep. Right? We're talking about a Christian deciding on their own that a fellow Christian couldn't be guilty and assigning that opinion to God and a court protecting that. Mm, yep. That's, that's the law. what really, really happened. Wow. So, after hearing that absurd argument, the judge checked with juror 13, who said, yep, I literally spoke to literal <laughs> God directly, not guilty. Literally what I'm saying. Yes, I said that. So that juror got dismissed. And apparently that was not a valid dismissal. Here's the reasoning from the 11th Circuit. Writing for the majority was Judge William Pryor, appointed by George W., not surprising. And Pryor argued that this could lead to all religious people getting banned from juries. What? Uh, apparently oh, that would be a problem. Me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess that would be a problem. Also, no the fuck it would. Right, it yeah, would not exactly. lead to that. Most religious people, first of all, are liars or they don't mention their hallucinations out loud. So it wouldn't happen that way. But also we just wouldn't do that. But according to Pryor, quote, members of some religious groups are more likely than others to report two-way communication with God. That's what communication means. Courts <laughs> may not conclude that their vernacular alone disqualifies them from jury service. And the dissenting opinion was amazing. It was like, yeah, we weren't. We were really focused on the vernacular. That was a weird thing <laughs> for you to say. Uh, regardless of the ghost-talking patois, it was more about the entire concept of the legal system getting thrown out the window by the majority just now. Okay, but even in his own opinion, he gives away the game, right? Because what Pryor means is, oh, they just say they talk to God. They don't actually talk to God, but you got to let them say it. Why? Right. <laughs> Why would you have to do that? <laughs> is there anyone else involved in the legal process you would allow to incorporate linguistic omniscience? <laughs> uh, fair enough. Read that back to me. No need, Your Honor. Baphomet will whisper it into my ear. <laughs> We're going to find out that corporations are demons, too, and you get yeah. the, the rights of demons. I don't know. Something's going to happen. Yeah. So, again, I just, this was real. This really happened. We talked about this story a couple months ago, and I believe Eli ended the story with, like, okay, but, you know, that's, it's going to, they're, they're appealing it, but that's not going to work. It worked. It worked. It worked. Yeah. So that was fun. I'm going to talk about this all the time. I'm never going to be able to stop talking about Ridiculous. this. Ridiculous. A federal court just ruled that religion gets an evidence exemption on a jury, an evidence exemption in court. That happened. Even after my extremely relevant amicus brief that explained how I checked with God and he said he never met juror number 13. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure I just got persecuted. Yeah, too. I'm pretty yeah. You could appeal yeah. now to the 11th Circuit. I don't, I'm not sure. And in turn, the other cheek book news, you know, as dark as the last year has been, even grumps like us here at The Scathing Atheist have to admit that more and more light seems to be peeking its way through the trees. Vaccination numbers in the U.S. are going up. Families are seeing each other again. And it's possible to make it entire weeks without seeing something Donald Trump has said or did. Thanks, in large part, to his complete and total ban from all social media platforms. <laughs> well, not all. He still managed to go on, I, I guess, frankspeech.com <laughs> or whatever to explain that the winning horse at the Kentucky Derby is, quote, a junkie. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He thinks a horse is addicted as if to heroin to an anti-inflammatory corticosteroid, which, which is just like America stealing the mm -hmm. election. That's a real thing, he said. Guys, he's such a loser at this point that he like, 
just inherently sympathizes with all other losers, even if they're horses. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm almost as delighted by that as I am by the fact that he hasn't realized that yet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, this week, Trump's ban on Facebook was upheld by their oversight committee. And as you can imagine, this was a chance for Christians to lose their minds about this all over again. And nobody managed it better this week than Shane Vaughn of Mississippi's First Harvest Ministries, who regular listeners will remember for trying to give credit to Donald Trump for the latest COVID relief bill and for looking like he got fired from his job as an extra on The Sopranos for doing fuck stuff to Crafty. <laughs> okay. I looked this guy up. I have never been more certain that a person calls a bagel Jew bread. Absolutely. <laughs> Probably while he's putting his dick in the hole at Crafty as an extra, extra yep. on the spread. I was like, I said, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say it. It's weird that you have a scale like that for him to top, but it's uh, <laughs> useful. Anyway, here's what Shane had to say about Trump's extended Facebook ban quote. And this is how he talks. So bear with me. Hey, they made the same mistake that Satan made when he killed Jesus Christ. By killing that one man and killing his voice, he created a world full of little Christians that echo the message of Christ. See? Stupid on the devil's part. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's dumb. <laughs> yeah, who can forget Christ's final words as he hung there, brutalized to the cusp of death upon the cross. Ha! Gotcha! Dumbass. <laughs> Face. I'm dead. <laughs> He continues, hey, the Bible says that had Satan known what was going to happen, he would never have crucified Jesus Christ because what he did was he started a harvest of Christians that echo the message. He had only one man to deal with. Now he's got a whole population full of us. Same thing we're doing with Trump. Let them crucify him. Seconded. <laughs> but now we're the echo and we're going to put it on every page, every Twitter account, everything we got because the oversight board didn't rule that we couldn't share Trump content. It's allowed on Facebook, for now anyway, so take advantage of it while we can. Nay. But, but it's not, though, right? Like, the fact that he was saying the shit that you weren't allowed to say is why he got <laughs> banned. <laughs> but no, Shane, run with that. Run with that, man. Yeah. And Shane, obviously, having a normal, sane reaction to Trump not being on Facebook anymore. That said, Shane, if your metaphor holds, buddy... You're about to be psyched when you find out what the DA of the Southern District of New York is up to, man. <laughs> You're going to fucking love it. Also, Shane, if you really want to pwn us, maybe just crucify yourself. Yeah. Oh, right. right in our face. You won't let me crucify you. Everybody would follow you. We're in the same state, Shane. You'd harvest more people like yourself. <laughs> yeah, probably. No, he's not. We're not. He's in Mississippi. I just gave him that voice. He does look like that voice. He does look like that voice. We should be in the same state. That's all right. Dumb guy with a Southern accent is overdone. Thank you. And in filthy monkey women news, Jane Goodall Fantastic. is the winner of this year's Templeton Prize for being an outstanding scientist who's willing to pretend religion kind of matters a little bit. Or in their words, she harnesses the power of science to questions about the universe and humanity's purpose. So... Obviously, especially if you know about the Templeton Foundation, obviously their prize is fucking stupid. Yeah. But it went to a real scientist, so that's good, I guess. And here's the best part. <laughs> Christian fundamentalists are freaking out because good all only medium pretends they matter. And they need her to pretend way fucking harder with very specific Christian words. Right. Yeah. You'd think with all the screeching and beating of chests, she'd know how to handle herself better in this situation. Yeah. Right. Right. So I just, I gotta be clear on this. Jane Goodall just barely qualifies as a scientist and she's only famous because like, the media loved how unscientific she was about her science. She anthropomorphized her subjects. She interfered with them as she observed them. And one of her books was pulled before publication because it was found to have blatantly plagiarized a dozen plus sources, including Wikipedia and a shitty astrology blog. <laughs> astrology blog? Yeah. She, she's Yikes. problematic as all fuck. She also made up a bunch of shit that the monkeys didn't do, which is well, the, for far. Well, every reason to believe that as well. Okay, she was, maybe she I, does belong in the Templeton she, she, Foundation prize More than list. you might have yeah. thought, yeah. Everybody after her was like, I've never seen the monkeys do that. And she was like, well, they did it for me, okay? <laughs> they fucking did it for me. When the, you know, when you guys aren't around, they, he, he gets up and he sings. He's, hello, my baby. Hello, my honey. It's, it's the whole thing. He does a, a dance. 
Okay. It's, she's got not the best backstory I just learned. I, th- I thought she was cool. Super cool until just now. Anyway. It's okay. No ruined Coco for me. So. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So in case anyone is not familiar with the Templeton Foundation, their stated goal is to fund research into the intersection of religion and science. So nothing. Yeah. They do not have right, their stated yeah. goal is to do something that does not exist. If those things ever intersect, it's because religion guessed something right. And mm-hmm. if that ever happens... Science will fucking let us know, and they'll use science to find that out. But the Templeton people are so desperate to find something, they pay for all these big studies, and and they keep failing just so many times. So many times. My favorite example is when they funded a three-year-long study on the therapeutic effects of praying for people getting heart surgery. And the study found that for patients who didn't know about the praying— It helped exactly zero, no help. Yeah, but the patients who did know about the praying were not quite so lucky as getting (laughs) zero help. For the people who knew about the praying, it actually led to a spike in the rate of post-surgical arrhythmia. It cost about $2.4 million to figure that out. If you want to pray for people... Just make sure you shut the fuck up about it or they might get arrhythmia. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, now that's a t-shirt I would buy. Yeah, See, right, I would right. buy that. <laughs> so apparently Goodall was raised Christian, but now she describes herself as spiritual instead of religious. Yuck, well, boo. The Templeton Foundation, <laughs> they can't buy a bucket. So they were like, mine, ours, <laughs> yeah. that's science, plus our thing, this counts. Right. We're taking Jane Goodall. But the intelligent designers at the Discovery <laughs> Institute are not having it. In a recent article on their site called Go Fuck Yourself, it's called Evolution News. They explain that Goodall talks about a life force that imbues the world with energy. But uh, vague magic is for hippies and Methodists, and they were pissed. And this is apparently their argument. Quote, Goodall dismisses her simplistic childhood view that our species is elevated onto a pinnacle separate from all the others. Okay, um, <laughs> quick quick pause here. It's very confusing. But yes, they are arguing in favor of a simplistic childhood view Okay, there. that's okay. what I heard. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the clarification. I, I looked at this for a while. That's the only thing I can think of. I'm pretty sure they yep. were like, no, it's simplistic and childish, you assholes. Yes, it is. <laughs> Continuing, it can easily be shown how this life force theory pales in comparison with the explanatory power of traditional theism. Well, quote. <laughs> that's the opposite of tr- the vaguer you are about your sky wizard, the less wrong you are. <laughs> well, right. So, but, okay. Th- but he didn't say anything about right. Like their view does have more explanatory power, right? Oh, it just you know what? That's very <laughs> true. Right? It's like, it's like yeah. if you're trying to decide if you should build your house out of jello molds or bricks of C4. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, yeah, you got to love a good idiot fight. The intelligent design people are mad at the prayer-based cardiology people because Jane Goodall doesn't specifically say that humans are magically special meat puppets for Jesus only, just Jesus. (laughs) Fuck you. And in Survey Says News, more Christians should listen to this podcast. And I'm not just saying that because iTunes recently got rid of the other category in the religious section where we were consistently in the top five. Higher if you didn't count Oh No with Ross and Carrie because they don't even go okay. here. Eli. What? It's, oh, we talked to a cult. Tell me there's no God. Cowards. For, Cowards. For, uh, for the record, Ross and Carrie seem like lovely people and they have a lovely show. Please ignore my co-host. Yes, Whatever. thank you. Fine. Two votes what Noah said. Cowards. Christians should listen to our podcast because if they did, they'd hear just how great it's going for them, right? They get extra rights. There's less rights for other people. And apparently they need to hear that because according to an informal survey done by D. James Kennedy Ministries last week, they are very sure that they are very, very persecuted. Okay, but um, I just did two informal surveys that say yep. no they're not are There's, we done I, I, I just, out? Oh, we're actually participated yeah. in two informal surveys <laughs> that seem to suggest the same thing boom three more <laughs> it's, five, it's five to one now. outloaded yeah so they surveyed around 1900 christians and the results like the respondents 
You're fucking crazy. <laughs> You're beautiful. I could go through this whole thing. Okay. In response to the question, quote, are you concerned about Americans who have been taken to court or charged with hate crimes because of their conscientious objections to homosexual marriage in scare quotes? 99% said yes. <laughs> oh my God. Fuck your face. Is one so said no. And 1% were undecided or didn't yep, answer. Right, yep. 99 said yes. One said no. One undecided. <laughs> yep. Yes. I guess that's the advantage of an informal survey. You get to have more percents than anyone else. <laughs> that's key. That's key. Wait, so 99% of informal Christians are scared of a thing that doesn't exist. Okay. You know what? That seems low. Now that I say yeah. it out loud, that seems low. Well, hey, speaking of things that don't exist, in response to the question, should students have the right to pray in public school classrooms at sporting events and graduation ceremonies, 97% said yes. 1% said no. What? And 2% were undecided and or didn't answer. 100% of people were able to pray anywhere the fuck they want. I because just, obviously that, you can do that wherever the fuck you that, want. That 1% who said no is a baffling group of human right. beings to me. They're blocking thoughts? What does that even mean? Hey, look, I'm Christian, but I don't know about all this <laughs> praying bullshit. Stop it. Just side tackling people. Stop praying. <laughs> But it gets better. In response to the question, have you experienced verbal or physical abuse or bias because of your faith in Jesus Christ or for your conservative Christian views? 96% said yes. <laughs> All right. Well, so maybe they're already listening to this show. We don't know. <laughs> okay. okay. I'm fine with the verbal and bias part for sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The whole survey is such an amazing box of crazy. They had a check the box, which of these pose a serious threat to the United States question on the survey. 87% mm -hmm. said China. Sure. 42% said Russia. 73% <laughs> said the United Nations. Uh -huh. What? And 81% said socialism. Oh, okay. worse even than the UN? <laughs> Sorry. The United Nations? Right. The United Nations is the kid feebly shouting, guys, wait up, of organizations. <laughs> That's them. Yeah. They're nothing. 31% more dangerous than Russia. Russia. I wish they had power. They do not. They, yeah. Right. Okay. One last thing on that socialism thing. Seriously, I could go through this entire survey so many times, but when asked, quote, should schools be required to teach students the truth about the history of socialism and its damaging impact on the world? 100% of respondents <laughs> said yes. So, so wow. honestly, the funniest part of this story, we'll link to it in the show notes, is the press release that breathlessly reports this as though asking Larry, his cousins, and their wives was an actual survey that's like, <laughs> this is up 31% from last year. <laughs> hey, I just did an informal survey. 0% of those people could define socialism, just for the record. <laughs> And in putting the lock back in caps lock news tonight, it's always <laughs> interesting when one of our scathing regulars seeps out into the larger world and the average American comes face to face with the festering insanity that is modern evangelical Christianity. And this is our lives. You yeah, all have to participate. Right. <laughs> exactly. Well, that happened again when CNN ran a piece about the fucking sapient hate crime that is Greg Locke. And the death toll from his COVID denialism on last Friday's Anderson Cooper 360. Specifically, reporter L. Reeve interviewed family members of a member of his church who died of COVID after accepting Locke's bullshit conspiracy theories. Yeah, I mean, look, anytime more people in the world hate Greg Locke, I'm for it. But I also kind of feel possessive, right? It's like, yeah, yeah I was uh -huh. here first. Do, do, <laughs> does L. Reeve even know his crazy Two medium coffees with a million sugars coffee. Shit, you don't even go here, El Reeve. You don't even go here. <laughs> so. All right. So now the victim here is a guy named uh, Coburn Kennedy. Coburn Kennedy. So I like I shouldn't be making jokes, but come on. Like, OK, so I'm assuming it was Colonel Mustard with the revolver in yeah. the billiard room with a name like that. Coburn yeah. Kennedy. If your yeah. name's Coburn Kennedy, you can't go into billiard rooms if there's a colonel there. Right. Well, exactly. Dumb. No. Exactly. So now he was a member of Locke's church that bought into Locke's repeated claims that the virus wasn't dangerous, that the pandemic wasn't a pandemic, and that the vaccine was somehow both sugar water and contained aborted fetuses. 
Ah, what? so that makes it a fetus smoothie. Well, actually, know. yeah, right, right. Uh-huh. That is a complex syrup. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of his nephews showed a family group chat where Kennedy parroted Locke's claims that the vaccines were both immoral and unnecessary. So needless to say, when the extremely at-risk elderly man got COVID, he didn't bother seeing a doctor about it until it was so advanced there was little that could be done for him. He died shortly thereafter. Uh, several members of his family rightly blame Locke, and more urgently, several members of his family still don't and still to go to the fucking church of negligent manslaughter. Yeah, and that's a generous deal for the name yeah. of that church, by the yeah. way. They had to plea that down to the <laughs> church yeah, of right. negligent yeah. manslaughter. Well, you know, the Supreme Court ruled last week that they're allowed to use loaded shotguns as communion wafers, so what are you going to do, right, yep. when there's nothing? yeah. Now, so Locke, of course, has been in damage control mode since several days before the piece aired, actually. Apparently, he was scheduled to do an interview with the CNN reporter, but he canceled at the last second because, you know, either uh, Jesus's ghost warned him that CNN was trying to set him up by broadcasting the answers that he was going to give to their questions (laughs) or the things he said. Yeah, right. Or somebody in his circle realized that the focus of the story was going to be on one of the people that he killed with his stupid. But since video of Greg Locke being homicidally stupid isn't exactly hard to come by, they just used clips they already had, like the one of him getting all the way flummoxed by questions like, okay, then what is a pandemic? Okay. (laughs) Noah's not exaggerating there. Just a reminder, that's a real question that stumped Greg Locke. His answer was... I'm 44 years old. <laughs> yes, it was. It's a pandemic. That's, that was yeah. the explanatory part. Right. And, and then his manager <laughs> side tackled the reporter and was like, you didn't say there would be questions. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think they go to someone like Hemet when they're doing research for this story? And he's just like, what video do you want first? I got <laughs> so much. <laughs> I've never gotten a call and I'm offended. So, okay. So look. The story is tragic, of course. He interviews a couple members of the family that are obviously none too bright and buying into everything that Locke is selling about the dangers of the vaccine and the safety of COVID, even after watching their relative die from it. But there are some silver linings to to tease out of this one. Those people will be dead soon, too. Okay, I wasn't going to mention that one. So the, the, the first is that the mainstream media is ramping up their coverage of the continued existential threat that evangelicals pose during this pandemic. And the second is that they've scared Locke into hiding. So not only did he cancel the interview, but he hasn't publicly reacted to the now five-day-old segment at all. Mm. And and that may indicate that Greg Locke is starting to realize that everything he says is dumber than the last thing, and most people can tell. But look, whether it's motivated by self-preservation or genuine remorse, anything that shuts up Greg Locke is worth celebrating. Oh, What's up, bunker boy? Nothing to say now? (laughs) You scared? Still invited on the show, Greg. No, you're not. You got Greg. somebody going to Duncan for you? It's going to be a very <laughs> legitimate debate. <laughs> Greg. And in the Rod to Perdition news, regular listeners to our show might remember a few months ago when Heath introduced us to an exciting new machine gun wielding MAGA loving cult known as the Rod of Iron Ministries. And it sounds like we're going to be hearing from them quite a bit more because we learned from Vice News this week that they have purchased themselves a $1 million compound in Texas for their, quote, coming war with the deep state. Oh, what could go wrong? (laughs) Yeah, that's every real estate person in Texas now dealing with this, being like, yeah, so Kitchen Island, a cute little breakfast nook right there. A great turrets for the war with the deep state, of course. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Right. Everybody in Texas. Okay, I just want to point out that for really regular listeners, you might also remember these Rod of Iron Ministry guys from as far back as episode 263, but like this is not the first time I've come to suspect Eli's not listening when I talk, but that's fine. That's fine. Heath you said it, Heath. Couple, you said it. So the leader of the group, <laughs> Hyung, <laughs> Hyung Jin Sean Moon, is the son of Sun Myung Moon the founder of the right-wing Unification Church and creator of the right-wing Washington Times newspaper. He's become increasingly violent in his sermons, saying in a recent one, quote, the internationalist Marxist globalists are trying to what? start a civil war here. <laughs> yeah, we need more nationalist globalists. Well, yeah. <laughs> so we're what the fuck does that mean? Internationalist globalists? <laughs> they want to bring in the UN troops and the Chai Com Chinese military to come in and destroy and kill all gun owners, Christians, and any opposition, i.e. Trump supporters, end quote. 
And only Mike Norris can stop him. Sorry, are we not in a movie trailer? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. were, I thought you were doing a movie trailer. Okay, so but for real, these. If the plan is to kill all the gun owners and your plan is to tell people to get guns, aren't you an accomplice now? Like yeah. some, in Ooh, some way? double agent. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> Later on, he said, quote, it's obviously better if we can use our rights to freedom of speech assembly to seek redress of grievance. Otherwise, we'll have to fight physically with many dying. End quote. No, no. I feel like you guys could take the U.S. military augmented by the U.N. troops and the Chinese <laughs> army, though. This, no, it's a good threat. You, you yeah, just, you got them. You, you got, got those turrets. You got the breakfast. No, risk. It's all about <laughs> the risk kitchen control. Island. <laughs> you got to get in their guard it's like a bear. <laughs> it's also worth noting that this past October, Sean created his own constitution and declared himself King of the kingship of the kingdom of God. Okay. Wait, what? Okay. Sean Il Gook. Kingpin, King Fisher. That's bird fuck. Okay. <laughs> Just the first three. King, King of the kingship. <laughs> oh, so yeah, that group, they now have a $1 million compound. Uh, coincidentally, 40 miles from Waco. Is that a coincidence? Where they're planning for a war with Santa Claus. Sorry, the deep state. They yeah, were right, yeah. war with the, in an, Instagram live video posted last week wearing a crown of bullets and sitting behind a gold plated machine gun. What? Sean said, quote, sorry, just you're you're wearing a crown of bullets and now you're going to say something out loud. Everybody just needs to remember that context. <laughs> yeah. Everything you say now. That's need the to picture it. Really check the link in the show notes because it's uh it's a lot. It's oh, like I feel like this story's just not going to age well. Us laughing it up about this shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You have to start every quote if you're wearing a bullet crown with I'm wearing a bullet crown <laughs> yep. and now I have something to say. And you say. have to end it with it. Yeah, absolutely. Quote, America. I'm is, wearing a bullet crown. Yeah, yeah, I'm wearing a bullet crown. Quote, America is ex existentially at a crisis right now. We have left God. We've become part of this licentious, decrepit, degraded moral culture. We have strayed from God's principles. That will bring a country to destruction. And God will allow it to be judged, just like he did with the Israelites. I'm wearing a crown of bullets, end quote. <laughs> and, you know, it's worth remembering that armed militants with imaginary enemies usually end up finding real people to kill anyway. So. Yeah, sure do. They do. So, yeah, that seems like it's going to turn out awesome. Right. Uh, we'll let you know with further updates as they arrive and hopefully without a body count. Yeah, God, where's Janet Reno when you need her? Next up in headlines. In a shocking turn of events, we have some delightful news about a prayer group. Huh. huh. Yeah. And it all started on January 6th. Uh, actually, that's not quite right. It all started when America turned into political hot garbage. Sure. So that was like uh, 1776. Right. Park. Yeah. <laughs> and then it festered. And then Christianity merged with the far right around 1980, just like the atheist community did recently. Weird. Same thing. That's uh -huh. exactly the same. <laughs> and then Trump lost to Biden. And then we got the Capitol riot. That included a man named Glenn Allen Brooks of Huntington Beach, California, who managed to avoid prosecution until now. And that's because he got on the text thread with his prayer group and bragged about the sweet, sweet riot he was part of on that Jesus thread. Jesus Christ. And, you know, that's uh, terrorism. Mm -hmm. So somebody yeah. told the FBI. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, not to throw cold water on the feel-good story, but it, it took the FBI seven months to find a guy dumb enough to brag about his terrorism on the prayer group text thread. So there's also <laughs> yeah. that. Okay, awful judgy for a man who's in several Facebook threads with me, no illusions. Okay, yeah, well, all right, withdrawn, withdrawn. <laughs> Just delete some stuff. So this might have been a bit more difficult for the FBI if Glenn Brooks wasn't just way too stupid to be alive. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it would be way harder. <laughs> yeah, he admitted to a federal crime on the digital record, but I'm assuming he was using his Clandroid Freedom phone, mm -hmm. which is unhackable, but... <laughs> Here's the thing lots of people don't realize about phones. Phone communication, it usually involves one or more other people with right, phones. Yeah. It's uh -huh. tricky. Also, he included photographs, some of which showed a bunch of other people at the riot, and those people are also <laughs> being investigated now. Good. And he included a literal selfie, smiling like an idiot with a room of 
very clearly the Capitol building in the background. Jesus God. And for the talent portion of my confession, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, say what you will about the 9-11 hijackers, but at least we didn't have to introduce their selfies into evidence. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> and here's my favorite part. This guy probably never gets caught without directly providing the evidence himself. And that's because he looks like an angry carpenter gnome with a goatee. And at the Capitol riot, that's a that's like a Where's Waldo situation yeah. with no Waldo. That's everyone at the Capitol riot. It's a bunch <laughs> of angry carpenter gnomes. Even in his selfie, he almost disappears because right behind him, there's like 50 other angry carpenter gnomes with goatees and MAGA hats. Yep. Yep, literally also taking <laughs> proud selfies to document their felony terrorism. Mm-hmm. So bottom line. The FBI needs to start making prayer groups. These people are <laughs> super dumb. Yeah. Easy to catch. And in who are you going to call? An ambulance news. <laughs> yep. Ghost hunting. Oh, God. A multi-million dollar industry based on walking around places looking for nothing. It's often illegal and irresponsible way to deal with both grief and mental health and... Sometimes it's just plain dangerous, as turned out to be the case this week when an amateur ghost hunter plunged 20 feet through the roof of Buffalo, New York's abandoned central terminal to the concrete oh, below. Oh, Jesus. Womp womp. But it, it doesn't even make sense. Why would a ghost want to haunt an empty, abandoned building? That's just boring. Right? I don't understand why you'd even look there. Right. And, and, but, and no fair dying and leaving your ghost there, lady. That doesn't count. That's like a fucking Sasquatch hunter making their own tracks. Yes, exactly. Now, <laughs> illegitimate. Podcast listener, before you worry that you're not allowed to laugh at this story, every news outlet I read assures me that this person is alive and well and therefore... Wide open for our mockery because people, if we can't make fun of those who essentially fall down a manhole looking for Bigfoot, there is no comedy left. We're out of comedy. I appreciate what you're doing there, but like how badly injured would this person need to be for me to not make fun of this? Like, I don't, there's no answer in my head. I don't have a line. Like, am I a bad person because I don't have a line for that? Don't look at me. I think it was funnier if she was dead. Okay. Right. There's so a lot of bits. I feel like the, the only way to know the right answer here is for more ghost hunters to injure themselves in increasingly <laughs> gruesome ways. That's a great. We need big data right. on that. Exactly. Call to action. <laughs> yeah. So no. I bring up this story. <laughs> I bring up this story for a couple of reasons. First of all, I wanted to make fun of this person right. because they fell through a roof while ghost hunting. Come on, people, this is gold. But also because a lot of the time when skeptics talk about bullshit like ghost hunting. I bet she felt funny. So <laughs> funny. <laughs> and you know that when she started to fall, she was like, a ghost. <laughs> it's happening. <laughs> Whap. Nope. Nope. Just fell. Ow. Call real doctors. <laughs> Call all the grown-ups are pretending hurting me. <laughs> but and again, so that's hilarious. We need to talk about that. But also, whenever skeptics talk about bullshit like ghost hunting, we get treated like grumpy spoil sports. Yes. And it's worth pointing out that like taking advantage of the grieving and the mentally ill aside, and we really shouldn't put those things aside. This shit's fucking dangerous, right? Ghost hunting by its very nature often involves sneaking around abandoned buildings in the fucking dark with people pre-selected for stupidity. <laughs> right. So once again, just a reminder in what possibly encapsulates the theme of our podcast, the answer to where's the harm is everywhere. Yep. All the time, everywhere. Yeah. Blank hunting. It's almost always bad. It's always like, bad. You know, Metaphorical ways. Ghost hunter hunting, as we just recommended. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Truffles? I don't know. Yeah, no, there you go. And in parole with the punches news tonight. <laughs> Thank you. You wouldn't think the First Amendment is still allowed to count would be the kind of thing we needed a court to adjudicate, let alone an appellate court. But holy shit, if that didn't have to happen last week, because apparently that much wasn't clear to a lower court task with deciding whether a parolee can be legally required to attend religious services, like as a condition of their parole. And they didn't get this wrong in a decided the case incorrectly kind of way, but rather in a dismissed the case because they didn't think being literally sent to jail for failing to attend Bible study was the kind of thing you could sue over way. 
Okay, uh, I got it. New Patreon goal. We start some atheist only jails where we teach athe- and the First Amendment's back. Weird. Look, look at that. <laughs> we back. So crazy. Oh, I'm glad because atheist jail actually already exists. It's called Quillette Magazine. It's um, <laughs> <laughs> cruel and unusual. So this is the story of one Mark Janney, a Colorado man who was released from jail in 2015 on the condition that he lived at a Christian homeless shelter in Fort Collins, Colorado. Now, to be clear, Janney did have a place to stay. He had family friends willing to put him up, so he was not homeless. Also, he was not Christian. Jenny made it clear to his parole officer that he was an atheist. But despite that, he was ordered to both live at the Christian mission and attend religious services while he did. Oh, that's uh, illegal. Well, you you think, yeah. So he moved into the shelter, but he refused to participate in religious activities. And because of that, his parole was revoked and he spent another five months in jail. That is terrible. And hey. I definitely admire Mark's commitment, but, but for the record, everybody, you have permission to fake it. You don't have to, but just okay. five months seems like a long time <laughs> no. for ideas. So, but here's the thing. I would do a lot more than five months in jail for what I would do if I was made to sit through a Bible study, right? So like, I no, this is the <laughs> lesser of two sentences. You could have changed their minds. <laughs> you know what, Mark? We don't want you in Bible study <laughs> right, anymore. Yeah, exactly. Now, needless to say, Janney sued, but in 2015, his case was dismissed by a district court. Now, in the court's defense, Janney elected to represent himself in this instance, so no doubt there were reasons for the dismissal beyond, nah, you should have gone to Bible study. But still, the motherfucker was literally in jail for refusing to praise Jesus. Right. So short of taking a shit on the judge's bench and calling it exhibit A, I don't feel like you could have fucked up bad enough to earn a dismissal. And six years later, and now that the ACLU and Americans United for Separation of Church and State are involved, the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals has affirmed my hunch and kind of smacked down the weak ass excuses the lower court gave for their dismissal in the first place. Also, just for the record, this was a two to one ruling. Yeah. And the dissent from Judge Carson accidentally explained exactly how stupid it was for the lower court and himself to get this wrong. Carson said the majority makes it so religious nonprofits now have two options. One, they can stop requiring religious programming or two. There doesn't need to be a two or two. <laughs> they can stop accepting parolees. And yes, yeah, the answer is one. Mm-hmm. It was one. We all knew it was one. They can help people without a religion bribe involved. Right. right. Or stop helping people with a religion threat. This isn't tricky. People. No. Or if they're unwilling to do that. Two, right? They could just stop having people sentenced to be part of their fucking thing. Yeah. Both of those are good options. Uh, either is fine. Yeah. Now, to be clear, this is a win in the ever so slightest sense of the word, right? Like it was a bar- like they barely got this goddamn decision. All we've established is that Janny is allowed to sue. He still hasn't won. And even if he does, the dude already spent five months in jail over this shit. The court can't give him five months of extra life after he dies. And beyond all that, the very fact that any court could say anything but guilty in a lawsuit where a dude was literally forced to be Christian as a condition of his parole is a big enough loss to cancel this shit out. But still, you should just be left to be like, shibboleth am i out good right Great. <laughs> but still we may yet be found to technically have rights in the u.s judicial system and after the last four years we're gonna chalk that up in the win column apparently oh that's a sadly big win yeah they should have to weekend at bernie's him for five months after he's dead <laughs> it's like, walk him around <laughs> and into bleach's own news tonight Mark Grennan just cannot ah, stop himself from feeding own. people industrial bleach. His job. Yep. Regular listeners will recognize the name. Uh, Grennan is the Archbishop of the Genesis 2 Church of fucking bleach and bullshit. It's, by Grennan's own admission, a designation to avoid government oversight, and that's it. And he's made it into this segment and our latest book by repeatedly selling bleach as a magical cure When his church was raided and all his products were destroyed, he kept selling medicinal bleach. When two of his sons were arrested and he had to flee to South America, he kept selling medicinal bleach. And now, as he sits in a jail cell in Bogota, Colombia, awaiting extradition to the U.S. for selling medicinal bleach, he's still selling medicinal bleach. (laughs) What the fuck is happening? I got to say, though, if there's anyone who can get those whites whiter, it's Mark (laughs) Grennan, right? (laughs) 
Yeah, if you're ever having a hard time explaining how the idea of religious freedom has dangerous overreach in the United States to someone, Mark Grennan is a great place to start, yeah. people. <laughs> there you go. Great example. So, yeah, we learned this from The Guardian last week. In a, in a phone call overheard by their reporters, he admitted that he was distributing his medicinal bleach to at least 75 of his fellow prisoners for ailments ranging from gastritis to diabetes. In the same call, he says he's obtaining the necessary chemicals through secret channels within the jail, adding, quote, what? you can't get it on the outside, but we got it on the inside. He's got a quote. bleach guy? Yep. Yeah, and, and apparently what? he's using the same clandestine phone he used to make that call to post all kinds of pro-bleach drinking bullshit on social media, along with videos urging people not to get vaccinated. Okay, <laughs> just for the record, the mules... That he's apparently paying to smuggle ass bleach into that jail are doing something way safer than his actual recommended use yes. of putting his product <laughs> in your ass to bleach away COVID and autism. Yep. Yeah. Balloon pops and all of a sudden someone's just not COVID anymore. Damn it all. <laughs> right, but the balloon doesn't always supply. pop. It's safer. <laughs> just some guy walks up to him. What are you in for? Murder. How about you? Oh, I started a church so I could legally tell people to drink bleach. Get this monster away from me! Yeah, right. Ugh. And and look, I'd love to think that don't drink bleach would be an easy message to sell, but the FDA has had to issue several increasingly stern warnings against Grennan's panacea. Their most recent one describes the product as, quote, powerful bleach typically used for industrial water treatment or bleaching textiles, pulp, and paper, end quote. And in case it wasn't clear from that description, it's also potentially deadly if ingested. But none of that stops Grennan from telling the parents of a six year old, for example, quote, children do pretty good. Give the child two or three drops every couple of hours. End quote. <sighs> you know, this whole problem would work itself out if we could just get the guy on camera and ask him to take some of the medicine he sells to other people. I'm just saying, I'm just saying yeah. if he actually took it, do it. Yeah. Solved itself. Of course, I'm not sure what outcome to root for here since the motherfucker's already in jail and he's still doing this shit. I'm not sure if that underwater prison from Captain America 3 is based on a real thing. But if not, <laughs> we might want to get to work on it is all I'm saying. Step ahead of you. No bleach in the supply closets, people. This is how it happens. Eli, you got an underwater prison guy, right? I do have an underwater <laughs> prison guy. It's true. Perfect. Chew. And in Lock Him Up News... Greg Locke, Anna. <laughs> talking about it's the newest, the greatest Christian freak out. That's right. Greg Locke said words. In particular, he is not happy with all these liberal cuck politicians like Tennessee Republican Governor Bill Lee. Right. <laughs> so Greg Locke went all the way off the rails during a sermon last week after Governor Lee signed an executive order to have the National Guard round up all the unvaccinated people and lock them in prison camps. Also, Greg Locke cannot read. He's right. not a reader. So none of that actually <laughs> happened. But we did get a freak out. Oh, Greg Locke is a Christian freak out, right? Like Anna's jingle <laughs> might as well be his alarm clock tone. <laughs> I'm just weirded out that Greg Locke and I had the same fantasy this week. Right. It feels <laughs> yeah. We should do that. It's fine. Yeah. So just to be clear, the new executive order from Governor Lee, it's just some basic preparation in case the people of Tennessee are idiots who won't get a vaccine and it leads to another overwhelming spike in COVID cases. And by just in case, I mean that is happening. Yep, it's happening, happening right now. We're all watching it. So Governor Lee is setting up a system to quickly build temporary medical facilities if needed. That bastard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Again, for people who read, that was clear from... The words in the order by reading them yep. with your face. But that's not Greg Locke. Here's the response. And just for us, he started his freak out with a string of <laughs> panicky white guy from Tennessee isms. <laughs> <That's pretty good. laughs> Quote, do you see this nonsense our governor signed? I don't care how much he talks about Jesus. Bill Lee is a coward. You tell him I said so. He's a noodle. What? He's a waffler. We Willy nilly nonsense. <laughs> and then maybe, I don't know, it probably like break a break, new, new syllables I haven't heard of, Rats but that was what they wrote. Frats in there. So <laughs> yeah. motherfucker has closed no closed caption guy didn't know what to do after that. About <laughs> lying people to death, but he can't say motherfucker because that's immoral. Jeez, what the hell is wrong <laughs> guys, with these people? Guys, 
I bet with the right fake Twitter account and a couple of phone calls, we could convince Greg Locke he's going to fight Bill Lee outside the state house by Friday. <laughs> we could do that by Friday. <laughs> and uh, come on, pussy. Locke also pointed out that <laughs> all the overflowing hospitals are actually a hoax. Either they're full of crisis actors uh, on fake ventilators, I guess, or all those hospitals are secretly empty. At one point, he said, why don't you carry camera sick in one of these <laughs> hospitals that are supposed to be overflowing and show me how empty they are? And I mean, so many good answers. Yeah, right. I guess. <laughs> but I guess he was just asking himself and, and he had no answer and he had to just move on. Continuing, they authorized the Tennessee Department of FEMA to build quarantine camps. I ain't talking about East Germany. I'm talking about Tennessee. Quarantine camps for the uninformed people that are still in refusal to be vaccinated. I mean, and quote with a weird kind of admission there with the word. Uninformed. Yeah, right. Yep. There's your answer. Yep. <laughs> the only thing you got wrong after the fucking hidden camera challenge was failing to start his little tirade with the words. I'm so stupid that. <laughs> <laughs> OK, OK, hear me out. Maybe Greg has become self-aware and he just doesn't know how to shift gears. Right, he's just like, I've made a terrible mistake. I don't know my way out of this maze that I have built around myself. <laughs> you walking backwards, buddy? That's nothing. That's not <laughs> where literally where? walking backwards. Are you talking tenet. backwards now? Tenant, 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 no? tenant. Tenant, 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 tenant. <laughs> and uh yeah, so uh, that quote I just gave you before, that was the end of the calm, rational portion of the sermon. From there, <laughs> he started literally screaming. Yes! And it very quickly devolved into Greg Locke just listing his enemies at the top of his lungs. We learned that he doesn't care what Bill Lee has to say, or what Joe Biden has to say, or what Nancy Pelosi's insurrectionist nonsense. Exact quote, I guess that thing as a sentient speaking entity has to say, her speaking insurrectionist nonsense. And he closed it out by vowing to fight and die to stop this, quote, deep state progressive communism. What? Again, just to be clear, he means emergency hospitals. Yes. Like, you know, in the Holocaust, <laughs> like in East Germany. You guys ever notice that everything is the Holocaust to right wing nutbags? Except the Holocaust. The literal yeah, Holocaust. Right. When yeah. they get all skeptical. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, they get skeptical at A equals A, but all the <laughs> yep. other stuff, no. Yeah. And on that note, we're going to close the headlines for the night. Pre recorded Heath, pre recorded Eli. Thanks as always. Jumanji. And when we come back, I'll already be doing the outro. Sorry. Before we let the dust settle tonight, I want to thank you one last time for bearing with us while we recharged for a bit. I also want to thank all of you for the great birthday gift suggestions that you uh, sent along for Eli and Lucinda. I didn't use any of them, and most of them were illegal anyway, but but it's the thought that counts. Anyway, that's all the blast we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Off and Blue's debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday, and an even newer episode of our half sister show Citation Needed debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, the music would refuse to queue if I neglected to thank Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick for being the kind of guys that make you look forward to your vacation ending. I need to thank Lucinda Lucians for being the kind of wife that makes you dread your vacation ending. And I also want to thank Teresa English for providing this week's Farnsworth quote, yes, but mostly for throwing her hat into the ring to help fix this fucking country also for making history by being the first candidate to ever announce their candidacy via farnsworth quote be sure to check the show notes for a link to her website or just go to vote teresa t-e-r-e-s-a english.com but most of all of course i want to thank this week's best people austin sarah jessica adams needs to sit down and work on her book blue oak kiernan lauren and alec austin sarah and jessica's unfinished book whose iqs have so many digits they've been named honorary polydactyls and blue oak kiernan lauren and alec who are so rational they make three sevens look like the square root of two over pi I don't, I don't actually get that joke. A math guy suggested. I don't. I, I'm pretty sure it's funny, but I don't get it. Together, these seven people, harangues and drought-resistant trees, came together to help make tomorrow possible by giving us money. Not everybody has the beauty and grandeur it takes to give us money, but if you do, you can make a per-episode donation at Patreon.com/scathingatheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but your money doesn't belong to you, you can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review, telling a friend about the show, and following at PIATPod on Twitter. 
Legal services for this podcast were provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robertson handles our social media, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scalingatheist.com. All right, before we go on vacation again, though, we have to get together and fuck a bunch of shit up in advance. Otherwise, I have to record extra outtakes. And that's just weird. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2021. All rights reserved.